Why am I doing this to myself? I mean, it borders on self-abuse. I had to take the stairs twice to carry all the records up there. But uh, how could I say no to a prog rock vinyl tech? So um, thank you, Vinylverse, for making me busy. Because um, refuse? I can't. But I have at least tried in some parts of the questionnaire to kind of subvert the expectation a little bit, but not too much. Mm. So let's get on with it. Um, I will try to be quick. Uh, I think uh, the, the only answer that is a little bit long-winded is the first one. So let's start with it. Um, what is the album that got you into Prague? Well, that's kind of interesting. Because um, when I was uh, 12 years old, and at this point in time, I showed almost no interest in music. At least not more than all the other kids that were kind of playing football outside and uh, maybe listening to whatever just came on the radio. Again, I was 12 years old. And um, that year my parents decided to escape our country to West Germany. So those are the years of the Iron Curtain and the Cold War and the Soviet Union controlled sector of East Europe. And um, so in the summer of 1983 we had arrived in West Germany and we spent the first year in a, some kind of a, a kind of refugee installation, uh, mostly with people from other East European countries, people from Poland, Slovakia, uh, Ukraine, a lot of people from Hungary, I remember. And my father gave me a Walkman. He bought me a Walkman. In those days, Walkman were really popular, hence they were quite cheap. And um, so I had a Walkman. I had these uh, kind of old-fashioned little headphones with that metal string over your head, you remember maybe? Uh, but I, I, did, I didn't have any music, so I was kind of walking around and asking people if they can just... Uh, donate me some cassette with some music on it and one guy just gave me this one tape and he really had no problems to separate himself from the cassette because he probably really hated that and um, this was the second live album by Yes called Yes Shows um, and uh, this is kind of a live album covering uh, the band's second half of the 70s mostly, so there's a lot of uh, Tales from Topographic Ocean stuff on it, and a lot of Rilea stuff, and Going for the One, even Tormato. Um, and uh, so this is quite a acoustic mayhem to some extent. And this was the very first piece of music that I actually consciously was listening to. And uh, it didn't make much sense to me, but uh, it was the only tape I kind of got, so I just put it into the Walkman and just listened to it while silently wandering uh, through these corridors of this refugee home. And uh, the funny thing is, like, I mean, it's, you know, young person's uh, mind is like a sponge. I think like two weeks later I knew basically every lick every solo accent, every syncopation, every weird moment on this double album and there are many weird moments there. So um, this kind of started me as a active participant in the musical world. And uh, from that I kind of knew what I wanted to some extent, as far as you can know. So the following two albums that kind of got me going were all in a pretty good taste, I think. The one was um, Metal by Pink Floyd. This could also have been a answer to the 1971 question that will come later. Uh, but uh, there are a lot of records here that, that would kind of cover <laughs> a lot of questions at the same time. <laughs> um, and the other album that uh, was kind of at the beginning of my personal musical trajectory was uh, Eye in the Sky by the Alan Parsons Project, which at this point in time just came out. If you are 12 years old and interested in adventurous music, I mean, this is the kind of album for you. This is just amazing and, uh, and extremely entertaining. Yeah, and uh, I think my the first Yes album 
uh, the first yes studio album I heard was uh, Time and a Word, um, as far as I remember. Um, here with the original cover. So, next question. Um, show an album with four or less songs. So I chose this one, Invisible Connections by Vangelis, um, as released on Deutsche Grammophon. Only three tracks on it. Um, show an album on the Vertigo label. Well, I brought two. One of them is Space Him by Ramesses, by the way, with a Roger Dean cover, so I could have used this also for the Roger Dean question. And what about the 1970 Gentle Giant debut on Vertigo? Next question. Show an album with epic keyboards. I thought it's it would be funny to show an album that does not have Keith Emerson or Rick Wakeman on it. So I chose Refugee. Basically the nice where Keith Emerson has been replaced by Patrick Moratz. Cool record. Question number five. Show an Is This Prog album. Yeah, those are these endless ongoing debates, right? What is prog and what is not prog and my personal... Uh, perception of this is always kind of very broad and I even to some extent I stop stop making distinctions between prog rock and jazz fusion and there are just too many projects on my shelf that kind of cover both so but I have uh, brought here three very obvious choices where we indeed can ask the question is this prog or not demons and wizards Uriah Heep with a Roger Dean cover. Pierre Morland's Gong, Downwind, with Mike Oldfield on the guitar. The always incredible Didier Malherbe on saxophone. And uh, what about Long Distance Voyager by the Moody Blues? Again with uh, Patrick Morat on keyboards. Um, next question is uh, show a prog album from an artist or band out of Germany. Well, I have here something from the 90s. This is Remember the Colors by the Bavarian band High Wheel. I think they made four studio albums. Uh, if you don't know High Wheel, just check them out. It's a pretty cool progressive rock band, probably somewhat influenced by maybe Rush, maybe a little bit King Crimson, maybe a little bit Yes, but at the same time, a think of its own. So this is Remember the Colors by High Wheel. Next question is uh, show a prog album from an artist or band out of the UK. So I thought uh, I will not answer this question <laughs> because it's, it's as a question is as a question it's a, it's a little bit underwhelming because like 95% of all prog bands come from the UK, don't they? More, one, could even, one could even say just show an album by a prog band and just a statistical chance that it would, be, it would be one from the UK is quite high. So I thought, what if I showed an album from a prog band from Italy, one from a prog band from France and one from a prog band from Czechoslovakia. Um, so let's begin with Italy. This is Alpha Taurus, um, a cool album from early 70s with a big gatefold sleeve here. Quite a nice cover. You kind of need an assistant for this giant covers. So one from France, Udo Voodoo by Magma. And the entire B-side is just a giant beast of a track. And uh, overall cool band that is basically a continent of its own. <laughs> and finally the the Czech Prague based um, prog rock band from the 70s called Modri Effect, Blue Effect. This is uh, an album they have recorded together with an orchestra and uh, it has a bit of a proggy Uriah Heep vibe to some extent. 
particularly if you like something like uh, Salisbury. So next question, uh, show a prog album from an artist or band out of North or South America. All right, but at the same time, this would actually be kind of a typical topic for the is this prog question. Um, Point of No Return, Kansas, probably one of the most online debated band <laughs> in terms of <laughs> is it prog or not. Of course it is prog. Everything is prog that I say that is prog. There is no other rule than what I say, <laughs> I mean, honestly. <laughs> and uh, the debut album by Journey. Obviously Journey is far from being a progressive rock band, but I always felt their debut album has a very kind of a proggy vibe to some extent and um, I always like this record. So next question is uh, show a prog gateway album, one you would use to introduce someone to the genre. So I really thought I would kind of subvert the expectations on this one. Now the answers tend to be maybe a little obvious here. So I thought let's try completely different records that are kind of on the on the verge, on the fringes of the prog progressive rock genre, but can, for a complete layman, can actually be kind of a soft, soft entry point. In Search of the Lost Chord by the Moody Blues. It's got a wonderful, more like psychedelic uh, folk rock album, but uh, with early prog aesthetic to it, kind of very conceptual. Um, so why not? This album here, one of my favorite records of all time. Um, Solar Fire, the Manfred Man Earth Band, fantastic. This is an epic album and uh, in my book proggy as hell but at the same time very psychedelic. Great guitar playing. And finally um, Enigmatic Ocean by Jean-Luc Ponty. Why not? Why not? With uh, Alan Holdsworth on guitar. And uh, this is a wonderful, uh, very melodic and kind of very laid back and at the same time very intense album. A lot of solos between uh, Jean-Luc Ponty's violin and Alan, Ho Alan Holdsworth guitar. And um, great fun to listen to and uh, without being too noisy or too heady. Uh, so I think this is actually a good gateway album into a more complicated world. But if we are talking about children, for example, very, very young listeners, there is just no better way than Journey to the Center of the Earth by Rick Wakeman and of course uh, The Myth and Legends by Rick Wakeman both wonderful concept albums that I think are very much uh, enjoyable for a young audience it's full of drama and adventure and it's all very cinematic so um, certainly two great uh, contenders for a gateway album to some serious music uh, for a younger person. Now I wonder who is this Brufford guy everybody is talking about? I just don't get it. So uh, next question. Uh, show an album with uh, Bill Bruford on drums. Even better if you can show albums from multiple decades and multiple bands. Well certainly one of my favorites, Lark's Tongues in Aspic, King Crimson. And a record that uh, I think to some extent is defining uh, the, the style of Bill Bruford. Gradually going Tornado from his solo work. This was the third album. Anderson, Bruford, Wakeman and Howe. The end of the 80s. Oh, those glorious days when you conceptualized your albums in the duty-free zone of an airport. And uh, what about Earthworks? Bill Bruford's second band. Fantastic jazz fusion in parts, kind of proggy and some incredible musicianship here. And finally, this doesn't get shown a lot. Um, Bruford Levin, Upper Extremities, uh, with David Torn on guitar. Um, this is quite an insane record. It's from beginning to the end basically mayhem with Chris Botti on trumpet and in a strange way it's like a companion piece to the David Torn album uh, Cloud Above Mercury. Certainly something you need to be in the mood for. 
Next question, show a concept album. Yeah, I, I have more concept albums here. So one of them would be Heavy Horses by Jethro Tao. Actually great concept, entirely without the usual esoteric sci-fi prog rock nonsense. Very down to earth. Literally. While we are talking about esoteric sci-fi nonsense, No Earthly Connection by Rick Wakeman. And 1984 by Rick Wakeman. Next question. Uh, show a female prog artist or band with a female lead. So what about Pascal Saint from the band Kos from Belgium? Singing the entire album without lyrics. Next question. Show a prog solo album. Someone who is in a prog band and released a solo record. I will show you two solo albums and they will both be by drummers. And none of them will be Bill Bruford. <laughs> so here is Ramshackled by Alan White. And uh, Fictitious Sports by Nick Mason. Both records that I very much appreciate. I think they are both great, heavily underrated albums. Actually, I listen to them more often than you would think. Now, uh, show your favorite Roger Dean cover artwork or show a favorite pro cover. So um, here, let's go with the classics. Uh, Tales from Topographic Oceans. Uh, this is probably one of his best works. As far as uh, cover design goes, that's just too fantastic. Um, but I must say, I never could really decide if I like this more than his work for Relaya. I mean, the Relaya cover, again, it's quite incredible, much more subtle, uh, much more toned down in colors, but uh, very evocative and uh, quite legendary. Um, show a prog album released in 1971, 50 years anniversary. Yeah, I'm born in 1971, so uh, this kind of resonates with me. So let's uh, show, for example, this one. The Yes album uh, by Yes. I mean, Yes released two albums in 1971. This one came out, I think, in March or April. And in October they already had Fragile on the market, so um, just imagine that. Um, yeah, wonderful record. Uh, certainly a good, uh, another good example for a gateway album into the genre. Uh, not too heady, but uh, very, very tasty overall. I mean, 1971 is one of the best years for prog albums, I think. So um, what about this year? Tarkus by Emerson, Lake and Palmer. Um, probably not my favorite cover, although over the years it had become quite iconic. I think Emerson, Lake and Palmer too had like two records in 1971. One of them was Pictures and Exhibition, the other, other one was this year. So, uh, what's the next question? Show a live prog album. Well, what about Genesis Live? This seems to be quite a uh, honored and revered live album. Watcher of the Skies, Get Em Out by Friday, The Return of the Giant Hawkweed, uh, Musical Box, The Knife. So a lot of nursery crime stuff. Um, next question. Uh, show the last prog album you purchased or were gifted. I think it was this one. Um, Steig Aus by Embryo. So this could also have been an answer to the German prog album question. This is a reissue that came out on Brain. Um, this is a wonderful record. It has Mel Waldron on electric piano. And uh, it's a very cool, very funky, very kind of jazz fusion type of album. But at the same time, it feels very proggy to me. And uh, it's generally a, quite a cool a psychedelic experience. Always nice to hear it. 
um, show a prog album released within the last 25 years. Well, since I have such a Rick Wakeman oriented uh, video today, what about The Red Planet by Rick Wakeman? This came out last year and I must say this is pretty wonderful. Uh, great joy to listen to this. This is just basically a four piece uh, with Rick Wakeman on keyboards just playing instrumental music, eight tracks over a double album, each side two tracks. It's all kind of very symmetric. Again, this, this whole album is a little bit like a kind of a companion piece or complementary piece to Six Wives of Henry VIII. Stylistically, it connects a lot uh, with that album, which is kind of interesting because this is more than 45 years apart. Um, so, show a prog album with an incredible guitar solo. Well, this must be Bundles by Soft Machine with uh, Alan Holdsworth on guitar. This is just a fantastic guitar playing from beginning to the end. Um, it's an incredible guitar album. If you like long, intense solos by someone who usually plays like 2000 notes per minute. And uh, why not throw in Hot Rats by Frank Zappa, which obviously is not that much of a prog rock album. But in a strange way, it's kind of a everything and nothing album. And, um, and maybe his solo on Willie the Pimp should be in every kind of list <laughs> that you can imagine. So I think this is a very, very influential record. And I certainly am, I'm certainly having a bit of a fun throwing it in here. Um, yeah, these were 19 questions. Now we have reached the question 20. And my records are slipping away here. Holy moly. So the last question is, what prog album is at the top of your want list? Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't have that uh, ambitious wishes in that regard, thankfully, because I certainly could not afford to have wishes like that. But I kind of have two missions I'm on, um, and thankfully these missions are kind of doable and not ruinous at all. The one mission is almost completed. I'm somewhere at 95% of uh, what I wanted to achieve. That's having every album that Alan Holdsworth, every studio album that Alan Holdsworth played on. And uh, I have to sit down and just uh, start to go through the checklist uh, just to figure out what I'm still missing. And uh, the other mission is the, a while ago I have discovered uh, this wonderful, wonderful prog band from Denmark, which is called Secret Oyster. And uh, all together they released five studio albums, but I have only this one. Um, and uh, I certainly want to buy the other four studio albums and kind of complete their catalog. This is an excellent uh, instrumental group from Denmark uh, that, uh, of course, includes a lot of jazz fusion. And I find their sound quite fantastic. So uh, that's it. And uh, I really tried to be as fast as I could because uh, with me it's always a risk that it turns out into some weird marathon. So um, I hope this made sense to you and uh, I'll move on. Have a nice day. Bye bye.